So let me begin by turning to Bert's paper of 1961 and providing a selected commentary on what we might discover there. So to remind you, to jog your memory, these are the two tables on IQ presented by Bert in his paper for adults and for their children. When one examines this data, several questions come to mind. One, when and where was the study performed? How were the tests administered? Were exactly 1,000 adults and 1,000 children tested? Was more than one child tested from a given family? How did the mean IQs for adults and for children both turn out to be exactly 100? Are the numbers three individuals in the upper professional classes, higher professional classes, big enough to provide reliable statistical evidence? And the listener can add more questions along these lines. Now, to answer these, we will have to turn to Bert's paper. But, as Keeman and others have pointed out, it is remarkable how little Bert actually says in that paper. So, here are some selected quotations from Bert's paper. The listener should bear in mind that quotes taken out of context could be entirely misleading, and so to get an accurate and complete perspective, she should turn to the original paper. But having said that, let me glean selected quotes which I think establish a tenor and the characteristics of the paper and the results. So, to begin, here's one. In the paper, we find the sentence that the surveys and the subsequent inquiries were carried out over a quite substantial period of about 50 years. Now, you should pause and think about this for a moment. A study which has gone on for a very prolonged period of time would imply that the results were put together from several smaller studies carried out perhaps under different conditions. Today, a statistician would call this a meta-analysis. But this was well before meta-analyses were actually formally put out on the table and analyzed and understood. It is not that they are useless. Of course, there is utility in meta-analyses properly done at the hands of a trained statistician. But the moment we put together several studies, many of them small, one should anticipate that variability and uncertainty is going to increase. And so it does. The listener might remember the case of Avandia from GlaxoSmithKline in the discussion on drug testing. Doubts were cast on the safety of Avandia using a meta-study, a meta-analysis. And based on that analysis, the Food and Drugs Administration enjoined that a caution be placed on the sale of Avandia, making explicit observation that a risk of a cardiovascular adverse event could be enhanced by taking the drug. A few years later, further studies caused the Food and Drugs Administration to change their minds and overturn the original ruling and say that there was actually no evidence that Avandia was in fact as dangerous as originally thought. The point here, of course, is that, that studies like these, which combine data, are important and can be useful, but carry enhanced variability and risk. Another quote from the paper says, or at least casts some light on how and where the tests were performed. So Bert says that the children, for the bulk of the data, were obtained from a particular county, a borough in London, which was, and the emphasis is mine, typical of the whole county. There are no details provided on what typicality means. So the reader has to form her own conclusions based upon 
a bold sentence like this about the likelihood that the data were in fact representative. Yet another quotation from the paper. The occupational characteristics were based not on prestige or income, but on the degree of ability required for the work. Again, notice that there's a significant subjective element in the classifications from one through six of the adults in the survey. This is not in itself bad or reprehensible, but what is difficult is for the reader to form a firm assessment of whether these subjective evaluations were well founded. And yet another, the assessments of adult intelligence were less thorough and less reliable. Why? Because Bert goes on to say that some of the tests were conducted by interviews, others by actual testing. But there is no data provided on what fraction of the tests were conducted verbally, what fraction were conducted by actual running of the test, what was in the test, which group were tested verbally, all of this is opaque. Here's one more, and this sheds some light on some of the numbers that we have seen. Right. Bert goes on to say that the frequency is inserted. So recall that in the upper professional classes, three individuals were apparently tested, adults and children. He goes on to say that the numbers were much more than three. Again, the emphasis are mine. He says, the number three was actually more near 120, and that all the numbers were scaled, were weighted proportionately to reflect the estimated proportions in the population as a whole. How were these estimates come at? We do not know. Was the weighting done proportionately, the same for all the categories? Presumably, but Bert does not actually say this. But if we were to make that inference, then if 3 were to be about 120, then perhaps 1,000, the number in the study for each table, was perhaps more like 40,000. 3 to 120, 1,000 to 40,000. But again, I caution you, Bert does not actually say that 40,000 adults and 40,000 children were tested. But perhaps it could be suggested by the wording in the sentence. And then he goes on to explain that the numbers themselves were rescaled and recentered so that the mean of the whole group was exactly 100 and the standard deviation 15 or the variance, the square of the standard deviation, 15 squared or 225. Why would he do this? It's not clear, but perhaps one explanation could be that assessments of IQ have, were traditionally placed on a scale with 100 at the midpoint, with a certain variability where 40 or 50 was considered very deficient, 140 was considered highly proficient, and so it was natural to try to center the data along those lines. The student who has done any kind of experimentation is well aware of the vagaries of experimental apparatus. If one, for example, does ultrasound imagery, then depending upon the equipment used and the skill of the operator, various baselines could move around. And so for the radiologist to interpret what the imagery actually is, she will have to recenter, rescale it so that all the images appear on a standardized scale. So perhaps a motivation along these lines was at work when Bert rescaled the data. But again, he does not say this. Now, at the end of this, the reader might well go away with the feeling that, well, Bert was certainly sloppy in the presentation of his data. And, well, this is a heretical statement perhaps, perhaps not unusually so for the standards of that time. But 
to move from sloppiness to an accusation of fraud is a very, very large jump. So this is what we want to try to get a handle on. Let me try to summarize some of the features that I have elucidated for you in through these comments in, in Baird's paper. So let's look at what the original says, or at least summarize it, and in parentheses, my take on what it does not say. First, the data were collected over a long period of time, 50 years, but the methodology is unclear. For example, some of the interviews were done orally, some by test. The children were selected from one borough, representative of the county as a whole, but we do not know what that means or how it was done. We don't know if more than one child was tested in a given family. So these were all unclear. The methodology was fundamentally unclear. Second, the sample size was standardized to a meal, a thousand. But it is suggested in the paper that the actual numbers interviewed were much, much larger. That in the upper professional categories, for example, three was more near to around 120, a scaling factor of 40 from 3 to 120. It seems suggested, perhaps, then that the entire table, if scaled proportionately, would lead to 1,000 being actually more like 40,000 individuals in each of the tables who were tested. But this was not explicitly said. And finally, that the IQs were recentered and rescaled so that the mean was exactly at 100 and the standard deviation, the unit spread, was at 15. It is not said this, but it could be perhaps in fact that the desire was to fit to a theoretical normal distribution with a mean of 100 and a variance of 225 or a standard deviation of 15. But what was the process of translation? Was there any unconscious bias or misunderstanding of how to massage the data? This is unclear. 